Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton, and this is Family Life in the North Country. Today I'd like to change the format a little. Once in a great while, we have happenings or events that really require some sober, serious thought. We have several events now that uh, could really be something to put our society at the crossroads. A crossroads and a point of very serious decision making. We have before Congress right now proposed legislation that radically changes, even revolutionizes, the way our society deals with family life. The old saying, a house divided or a kingdom divided cannot stand. Some of you recall that from Lincoln's address, and Lincoln got it from Scripture. But that seems to do exactly, that's a reflection of what today is the serious problem. All in the name of Freedom of Choice Act. Freedom of choice. It sounds good, popular expressions like that. But what that really comes down to is that some family members would not be considered legal persons, and some family members would be. Some could simply be eliminated for reasons of age, place of residence, circumstances of one's own conception, or actually for no reason at all, simply because of an opinion of the parent. I really challenge you to join me in reviewing the video that follows. What we have seen documents the seriousness of the problem. Revolutionary changes taking place in the family. What we're talking about is something to do away with parental responsibility, something to do away with required informed consent in all medical procedures, something that cuts deeply into the spousal integrity. And actually what we're really saying is that in the name of the life of the preborn child, that as long as the child is preborn, for reasons which seem to be mostly monetary, there are people who are proposing legislation that's going to have a very serious impact on our family life in this society for the next generation, for quite a few generations really. You and I have an obligation to express our views, to share our views to our lawmakers, and to do that quickly because what's involved here is really quite serious. And most people don't want to look at it. Most people don't want to think about it that way. But it's really serious because of those factors, parental responsibility, informed consent, spousal integrity, and the life of the preborn child. Join me in doing something about this. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton, and this is Family Life in the North Country. I'd like to take a little different approach today. Several people have asked from time to time, what do I really believe is the cause of the social problems that have an impact on the family? Well, you know, the family is the central institution. It's the central part of most people's lives. When we really get to thinking about what family really means, all of us have a family of orientation, the family we grew up in. Most of us then, when we grow up, have a family of procreation, the one that we have, our own children. But family seems to be so very important. I think it's a good question, a good series of questions. But let's see how you do. For example, if you were asked that question, how would you answer the question? What are some of the causes of the social problems today? The problems that have an impact on the family. 
There are several different ways of looking at it, several different ways of starting. But uh, let's see. We could take family breakup. We've talked about that quite a few times. Family breakup. <clears throat> The fact that people are divorcing today at a very, very high rate. Single parenting, you know, after people divorce, they stay single or remain single. Some people are single parents because never marrying, but become parents and decide then not to marry. Uh, that is associated with every major problem that we know about youth. What do we know about what causes that? What causes it? Well, let's look at it. People are being educated differently, educated in the schools. They're being educated uh, by popular media, the literature, the publications, the television, whatever the media might be, all vehicles seem to be pointing toward the popular stand that marriage and family and integrity and family and commitment is not important. If you uh, doubt that a little bit, take a turn watching some soap operas and see what the themes are. And about 55 million people a day watch soap operas. That's a big, big media. Well, people aren't being taught to respect family. For example, in schools today, the school people are really under the bind, aren't they? They get directions from the state government, they get directions from federal government. It used to be that school boards, made up of people who were elected, agreed to serve without any money, whatever, any payment, all they really wanted to do was to try to see that the schools benefited the children. And I think most people who go on school board certainly have that idea. That's what they intend. But I've talked to several, and what they tell me is that they don't really have many decisions that they can make about what children are taught and how they're taught. They have so many regulations coming down that they uh, sometimes feel their hands are tied. It used to be that a school board would pick teachers who represented the standards of the community. That was the whole idea. A local school, the teachers representing basically what the parents wanted their children taught in terms of values, or at least not contradicting values and reinforcing the values. Schools today have become so secularized and of course, they were always intended, the public school was to be non-religious, but they have gone so far astray that you're probably well aware of some of the ideas that, about prayer, <coughs> about what can be done in schools and what can't be done, what can be taught. It's quite intentional that secularization has taken place. And most schools today are teaching what is termed a humanistic philosophy. The humanistic philosophy is certainly a philosophy that that undermines family. It undermines what some people think is really the essence of our society. Most people uh, hear the word and they think, great, humanism stands for the human being. Well, it does. But it stands for the human being superior to anything else. It, in the humanistic framework, there is no God a religion which uh, inhibits people is considered to be wrong. Uh, humanism is first atheistic, and it teaches a situational ethic, and you have to really go to a school or pay attention to school curriculum to see how often situational ethics comes up. The young people are taught that there are no right or wrong answers, that what they want to do, if they really decide to do it, that's all right. Well, number one, I haven't met any parents who teach their children that there are no right or wrong answers. I'm sure there are some, but I haven't met them. The parents I know, the ones I've listened to for a long time and I visit with as friends or associates or as clients, they all tell me they want their children to believe in certain things. 
that uh, some things are right and some things are wrong. Schools are caught up. Most people go into teaching wanting to do the very best they can for the children and they find themselves uh, oftentimes crippled by what they can't teach. I recall a teacher uh, in a school not far from here when the rule came out that there could be no prayer in school, she liked to start her school day with a prayer in the classroom. Well, she conceded to that very quickly. And so instead of a prayer, they sang, God bless America. And for her, it was uh, coming across the same thing. But it was an ex example of how sometimes teachers are frustrated. It used to be quite clear that most schools expected the students to follow such things as the Ten Commandments. Now, whether or not they called it the Ten Commandments, they called it something else. But they called it rules and regulations. They called it part of discipline. So what the schools are doing today, inadvertently, I think, certainly not intentional by the part, on the part of the teachers, what they are doing, though, is contributing to problems in society. That's my opinion. You may have a different opinion. And if you do, that's great. Prove me wrong. There's another big area contributing to problems. Materialism and individualism. These two things go together. Individualism, promoting the individual rights above all others, with the right of the individual, is superior to the rights of a family, the rights of society itself. We hear a lot about that, and certainly there's some merit in that. You know, we have a country that was based and founded on freedoms, integrity, responsibility, and the right of the individual. But we have to go back and look at it, too, and think that this country was also founded under God. In other words, you go back to the Declaration of Independence, and you certainly see and read in the Constitution that there was always a respect for some other power greater than ourselves. We have things in our society contributing like uh, pornography. Uh, oh, about a month ago or so, maybe, we talked about that on one of these programs and looked at pornography as iconoclastic, that is, attacking certain family values. We have permissiveness as a major problem. In schools, in the homes, we have permissiveness being promoted both ways in a sense of saying that the children have a right to decide for themselves what they want to do. And whatever the children want to do is all right. Permissiveness is one way to promote individualism, but it's also a way of promoting a lack of respect for authority. And any person who is 50 years of age needs to visit schools and see how much that has changed from the time you were a child. It's just really incredible to see the changes that have gone on. And some of the schools, it's certainly more recent than that. Twenty-five years ago, schools were quite differently run than they are today. We look again at certain patterns to see what goes along with a loss of respect, loss of respect for parents, loss of respect for teachers. I've listened to teachers who tell me that they really have no authority in a classroom. If the children want to do something, they feel bound to let the children do what they want to do. Listen to parents say they're afraid the children won't love them if they don't let the children do what they want to do. That's sad, isn't it? Because it doesn't really work. The children need to be taught, they need to be disciplined, they need to be given the opportunity to learn what is considered to be right and proper, to have values. We look to see other problems. We see mothers working out of the home. That's a major change, isn't it? Children today, by comparison, have very few adults in the home. Again, that materialism. Why do mothers work? Most of them say they don't really want to at first. They're working because they need to. Some pretty good studies have shown that uh, the profit motive is not really there. 
By the time the expense of another car or clothes or all the things that go into making another job possible, the profit is very, very low for another job. But we see people who are working for materialism, our standard of living is said to have increased quite considerably, but most of it is a standard of living based on more toys. Toys such as uh, boats, house trailers or camps, and ATVs, skidoos, or some kind of snowmobile. We look at a standard of living. Some of homes have a television set in every room, stereos, materialism. People work to support these things. They have new cars. They need to support their automobiles. Certainly young people learn that at a very early age. We look to see one of the major impacts in society has been the women's movement, the militant feminist, the National Organization of Women, very dedicated to changing society. Right along with that, the gay and lesbian rights groups, the homosexual groups, not just to find uh, acceptance of their lifestyle, but quite deliberately at times to change the lifestyle of other people. That's part of what's going on in breakdown of the families. We see more drug and alcohol problems. Why? Because of permissiveness again. We don't have more problems than we used to. <coughs> Human nature hasn't changed. People don't need to sedate themselves, but the individualism seems to want to go for what's right. We look at these problems, we see that uh, a large number of fathers are abandoning their families, abandoning children. People are not really uh, making a commitment in marriage and the family as they once were, and that is a major problem. We look <clears throat> at the loss of respect for life, at the beginning of life and at the end of life, and perhaps we'll soon see in the middle of life the sandwich generation, those people who are supporting the young and those people who are also supporting the elderly. The loss of respect for life has all sorts of radiation effects. Sometimes that comes under a heading of a contraceptive mentality. That doesn't mean just the use of a contraceptive. It means a whole system of beliefs that we can regulate life and turn it on and off as we wish. And that's a major factor in society. We see problems in the judiciary system going from what's called sometimes substantive ethics, that is, where there is a belief, a hardcore line of belief, to what's called procedures. As long as people follow the right procedure, the process becomes more important than what people believe in. We look at all these things, we haven't really dug very deep in any of them, have we? How did you do? What did you come up with? as the major causes of problems today. I have many more things that I could mention, but for this time, you know, in just a very few minutes here to share with you some of those things, I think we uh, perhaps next time can look at what do we do about them? Because that's a challenge. One thing to identify a problem, perhaps we can light a candle rather than just curse the darkness, as some groups say. I invite you to do that. See what we can talk about in terms of solutions to some of the problems. Until another time, this is Dr. John Middleton. Have a good day. Hello. I'm Dr. John Middleton, and this is Family Life in the North Country. The last time I challenged you to think with me about some of the problems, the causes, of social ills, a breakdown of the family, and we talked about a lot of different things. This time, I'll challenge you to think about some of the remedies, some of the cures, Remember, some of the changes have come about with very good intentions. People basically intending to do the right thing. But every change has some kind of result, doesn't it? It has a spin-off. One change impacts on something else. 
So we have to look to see what is the cost, what are the benefits. And some of the problems that we mentioned last time, such as secularism, the humanism, the lack of commitment in families, a breakdown in family life, materialism, increased permissiveness, drugs, alcohol, delinquency, and so on. All of these things seem to have been related. It's like a, a chain. One problem leads to another one. Perhaps some of the solutions will do the same. For a few minutes, let's challenge ourselves to look at it. Rather than thinking, well, those are problems that nothing can be done about. I don't accept that. I don't know any problems that can't be worked with. Some are certainly more difficult than others. Some are going to take a long time. Because most of the problems didn't just happen suddenly. It's a whole series of things. Let's look to see what we can come up with. Maybe one way of looking at it <clears throat> let's talk about parents, let's talk about schools, let's talk about churches. Put a lot of these problems under those three headings and see what we come up with. Parents. When do we start teaching people how to be good parents? Good parents. We start teaching them about the time they're born because they need a good model. They need a model to follow. We need parents today who will start off believing it. Yes, family life is important. They make a commitment to families. They make a commitment to the children. And they're going to stand by their children. I think this is particularly true of fathers. It's sad to see how many fathers are abandoning their children, just plain walking off and not supporting them. Well, we could stop that. We could stop that several different ways, <clears throat> perhaps with laws enforcement of laws. We have plenty of laws on the books, but we're not enforcing them. But I think more importantly, we need a shift of attitude. What's really important for a man? I think a man would not abandon his family. Little boys might. Sometimes we look at some of these guys that weigh 200 pounds. They're big and ugly and raunchy. But they don't act like men. They're acting like little boys who don't want responsibility. I think if we educated our people better in the home, starting in the home, but following up in schools, where schools certainly didn't try to teach all the possible alternatives to family life, but taught primarily, as they used to, how important family life is, that it's a central core of everyone's life. This is what most people want. This is what most people really believe in, the real values of family life. Every major poll that's been taken supports that idea. What we have then is a need of people making commitment, both men and women. I think there needs to be a difference in gender. We've had a society that's been rolled along to say that there's no difference between what a man does and what a woman does. I don't think that's good for family life. <clears throat> Certainly you have a right to disagree with me, but I'll respect your right to be wrong. I think kids need fathers and kids need mothers. As far as I know, they're not the same. We need people who not only can make a commitment to take care of the children, protect, provide for their children. We need people who will themselves lead a chaste life, who will model chastity. That means to live according to certain standards. Certainly there are moral values, there are ethical values. Those things are healthy, they're not a problem. We need people who are willing to model chastity, who are willing to teach chastity, and who expect their children to abide by it. If we don't expect the children to really conform. They're not going to. That's important. We have people today who aren't really expecting children to obey, to comply. So, better preparation for people for marriage. Not necessarily in courses like a college course in family life. No. <clears throat> Sometimes that uh, takes people away the way it's been taught. And I should know. I've taught them 
many family courses, many, many family courses. And I know that how it's taught depends on what people will believe after it's taught. It'll influence them one way or the other. And most family life courses are taught to make it a secular family, <clears throat> not something that is confined with a commitment. It used to be taught that way. Home economics used to stand for that. That was really what it was about when it first started. It, and along with a lot of other professional changes, came about and decided to become less committed, more equalitarian, egalitarian. Certainly we can have equality and egalitarianism, but we don't need to have the same roles for people. I think that's different. Let's look at schools. Perhaps the best thing to do right now to correct most of the problems with schools would be to have people with a freedom of choice about what school. We have a growing pattern of home education, and maybe that's the best way at least for the start, but if we're going to work with a school that's there, and I certainly think most teachers want to do a good job, most school administrators would like to do a good job, perhaps we need to remove some of the uh, regulations and let them do a good job. We could put back, if we remove some of the regulations, the idea that the teachers have to represent the values of a community. You know, if we can go right down the list of schools in your area, in mine, all over the place, and we find that the teachers themselves today may not be modeling the values that were once considered quite important. Maybe in the past their values were too strict, but now they're too loose. When we see teachers who in their private life are seen by their students, not living up to standards, not living up to community values. <clears throat> Students pay attention to them, just like they do their parents. The significant others can be parents, can be teachers. And it's one thing to try to tell children what to do. It's quite a different thing, isn't it? To show them how to live a good life. The schools need to adopt curriculums that in no way contradict family values. We have many curricula today, courses that are really contradictory to family values. Why does it pay off that way? Perhaps it doesn't. If we look at the intention, the intention most of the time is to promote individualism, but does it really pay? Are the students better for not having a belief in strong families? Take the recent crisis, and it's an ongoing crisis, but at least it may have come to a crossroad in New York City. A group of parents rose up, members of school board down there, and one particular school board, they got fired and they got reinstated, but they didn't really like what the school was trying to impose. The long-term benefit? <clears throat> I certainly go with the school board people who made it really hard and not hire the chancellor for the New York City school, not rehire the person. What that person wanted to do, and he wanted everybody to go along with him, was to change the way people think about themselves. All in the supposed program to prevent AIDS. Now that <clears throat> doesn't really measure up. We need to look sensibly at some of the school programs. What's being taught? What we have today in the schools we have a lot of people in different subject areas teaching values about family life. We have it being taught in English courses, we have it being taught in social studies courses, in health classes, in history, well they used to be called history, that's part of social studies. We have people who are promoting individualism above subject matter. <clears throat> Again, we could have a school program that promoted chastity. They used to. It didn't hurt to teach kids to live a pure life, to be chaste. It was beneficial. It still is in a few schools, but uh, it could be generally. You know, these major studies 
of schools across our nation, the Commission on Excellence in Education, found that some of the best schools had very low budgets, had no real money, did not have standards that uh, big schools have. And speaking of schools, we've listened recently to efforts to try to put schools together. <clears throat> That's a big problem. What we have is a need for smaller schools. Schools over 300 students start losing out, don't they? Schools like uh, being proposed by the State Board of Education to have schools of 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 students supposedly to save administrative costs, that costs too much. The students get lost. I believe the research and education will show that uh, smaller schools do a better job. Well, let's look at another area that we can work on. Mm -hmm. We can have some changes in the churches of our communities, churches in general. Do you know that one of the changes in churches is they have too, they too have become secular. They've been teaching social action programs and not teaching the spiritual dimension. And I'm saying that generally about all kinds of churches, the Catholic, the Protestant, churches of Judaism. Most of them today focus a great deal more on social programs than they do on what is the real basis of their distinctions. Is this benefiting people? I don't think so. <clears throat> we have to have morals if our society is going to exist we have to have standards see a moral is a standard usually in reference to a religious standard we have to have morals taught we have to have values a value is something which is considered good and desirable we have to have ethics those things which are considered right and proper more than anything else these should come from the churches the religious institutions to justify their existence, to justify their being. If they don't teach these things in our society, then perhaps they shouldn't exist. We have the need of indoctrination of young people. It's sad, but I hear a lot of teachers tell me that you can't indoctrinate children. Well, children don't come equipped to reason they come equipped to learn and they learn best at very young ages by indoctrination by modeling by having firm consistent kindness clear discipline most of the modern education programs are trying to get people to feel good about themselves and when they feel good about themselves then to try to teach them the subject matter I don't think it works that way I think that's a contributing factor to some of the problems it's great to feel good about yourself, but how about teaching, and at first, by indoctrination? In other words, we don't expect a youngster to know why he shouldn't run across the street in front of a car. We don't need to have him know the reason, the coefficient of friction about the brakes on what kind of surface and how much momentum the car has. We don't need all that explanation before the child is taught rather simply, no. That's not something you do. Don't. That's the shortest possible way of teaching children before they can reason. It's sad. I'm not opposed to education, <clears throat> but sometimes the educators seem to have gotten a little bit off base. The same way with the preachers, the ministers, the rabbis, the priests. Sometimes they've gotten off base. Off base in terms, they have a job to do, a necessary job in society. The schools have a job to do, a necessary job in society. Families have a job to do, a necessary one. These three institutions in our society, the educational, the religious, and the family institutions, are needed. And I think we can make major changes in reclaiming our society in a way that benefits most of the people. If we really look at it, most changes were intended as good changes. 
some of them get ahead of themselves and unfortunately most changes take on a personality of their own don't they in other words once something is started it has its own momentum here's just a sample of things that we can do they have concatenations that is they are linked in a way like a chain to many other things in society we can make a difference the difference can start with you the difference can start with me how do we want society to change do we have the nerve the courage let's try it until another time this is dr john middleton have a good day